This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Bark and Swagger on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Jody Miller Young. You might recognize her name as a member of the royal family of film, but Alison Eastwood, the actress, director, producer, daughter of Clint, is also a committed animal activist, rescuer, and foster mom. She founded the rescue sanctuary, the Eastwood Ranch Foundation, in 2012, which focuses on those in distress and high kill shelters. And she produced a National Geographic television program, Animal Intervention. But her newest venture solves a problem plaguing every shelter and rescue organization. How to locate suitable fosters for animals in need. Enter fosterforkids.com, a national resource to match fosters with shelters and rescues city by city around the country. So we're here today talking with Allison about that, her latest rescue missions, and just how many animals she has now. The last time we spoke, I believe it was up to 10. And we may even talk a little Clint. So don't go away. Grab that favorite beverage while we take a break from our sponsor. And we'll be right back. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Bark and Swagger on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Jody Miller Young. If you've just tuned in, we're here today with Allison Eastwood of the royal family of film, The Eastwoods, to talk animal activism, rescue, and her newest venture, fosterforkids.com. Hey, Allison. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How you doing? I'm doing really good. Thank I know you it's for a having long, me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time out to do this with us. Um, I know it's a bit of a long-winded introduction, but I want <laughs> everybody to know what an amazing person in the rescue world that we are talking with today. So I'm really, really glad that you're with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, you and I spoke earlier in the year for a story I did in Hampton's Pet on the Eastwood Ranch Foundation, but for listeners today... Fill them in on the ranch and its latest news. Well, you know, we're always busy doing rescue here in Southern California. And, of course, you know, we try to help lots of other rescues and and help on a national and global level on behalf of any animal welfare that we can. But we've been really busy, you know, just lots of dogs and cats. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, here in L.A., we have a lot of high kill shelters and a terrible overpopulation problem. So we're, you know, we're always busy. And so I've got, let's see, eight kittens in our cattery in the garage that are being fostered. And then we've got another 11 cats and kittens at the vet still that are getting over various issues from the shelter and, you know, lots of dogs. We're doing a dog transport to Vancouver. So lots of, wow. lots of, you know, lots of stuff going on, trying to always find homes and get everyone safe and spayed and neutered and happy and healthy and socialized so that they can go off and find their forever home. Bless you. I mean, it is a never ending thing. I see it here in South Florida and it's that way. I think in most, if not every part of the country, there are so many animals without homes, so many animals in terrible situations. But part of the issue, as I've certainly seen from my experience down here with the rescues that I volunteer with is foster homes. So that's where your newest venture comes in, which is a Super great idea. Fosterforkids.com. Tell us about how this came about and how it works. 
Yeah, well, it was a sort of an idea that came up with my rescue partner and she, you know, was having problems with fostering and she thought, you know, there's all these great websites out there like Pet Finder and Adopt a Pet and you know, places where you can find adoptable pets, but there aren't there's no database for people to find fosters and, you know, mm-hmm. fostering is such a integral part of rescue. I mean, if you can if you can get an animal out and put right into a foster home, I mean, it's just, you know, you, you free up space for another animal at the shelter, you know, you save a life and you're also socializing an animal, taking it into a, a loving, quiet environment as opposed to going from a shelter into like a boarding facility or a vet or another cage right into another cage. So this is mm-hmm. just a great way to participate in animal rescue without having a long-term commitment of actually adopting an animal. So, you know, she and I said, well, why don't we start a website, you know, since we're looking for fosters and I'm sure the other thousands of rescues out there are looking for fosters and transporters as well. And that's really just how it came about. It was born from necessity and uh, we went live, let's see, January 1st of 2017 Mm-hmm. So it'll be a year in January and it's, we're sort of slowly building it. You know, it's a, it's a free database for anyone in rescue or shelter. And basically you can go and sign up as a rescue or you can sign up as an individual foster. You create a profile similar kind of like to like why we like to call it like a match.com, but without the romance, just the love. <laughs> so <laughs> we, great. it's a really about matching people in your area. And so after you create a profile, you put in your zip code and it will show you rescues in your areas that are looking for fosters and you can pick which animal you can say cat or a dog or there are other animals too. You know, there's bunnies and different types of animals that end up in shelters. So mm-hmm. you pick what you want. You can be very specific and you can either negotiate to possibly be a paid foster or you could be a volunteer foster. It's just putting people together so that we can create more fosters and more people and more connections to help more yeah. animals. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those, why didn't anybody think of this sooner type of things? Because it solves such a big problem. Does it only work for shelters and rescues to search for a foster? Or can an individual who rescues an animal but needs a foster and isn't affiliated with a particular shelter or rescue, can they search for a foster as well? I think at this point, when you sign up as a rescue, you really need to be a 501c3. Um, So it's important to, you know, I mean, we oversee the website, but, you know, we're not actually, we're just putting people together. So it's really up to the rescue and the individual to vet them, to make sure Mm -hmm. that they're happy with the situation. Mm -hmm. This is really just a way to put people together, but we do want people to have the proper paperwork and we do want 501c3 rescues just because, you know, we feel at that point we've done our best to, to set everybody up for success. Mm -hmm. Um, and protect the animals. Yeah. I mean, it's important to have your paperwork and to be a rescue, a legitimate rescue. But again, you know, this is just a website where we put people together and we let them sort of, you know, once they make the introduction, then they can go off and figure out what the fostering process looks like for them as an individual rescue. Now, you've personally fostered about 20 dogs over the years, I think. To help listeners who might consider being a foster, to you, what's the best part of being one? Well, it's just such an amazing thing to do because especially like for us in our house, we have cats, we have dogs, we have bunnies, you know, we have all kinds of critters here. So mm-hmm. when I'm fostering, you know, it's a, it's great because what the wonderful thing to see is this, you know, animal, whether it be a cat or a dog coming out of a traumatic situation, being in a noisy, dirty shelter, and then all of a sudden coming out and really getting to socialize and integrate and, you know, getting to be dog friendly. I mean, all the kittens that we foster, we get them good around our dogs and and get them good around other cats and lots of love. And you you just get to see them fatten up and get happy and playful. And, you know, you just really get to see sometimes animals are very shut down after coming out of a shelter. So you really get to see them open up and see what their personality is like. 
get to know them. You know, it's great for any potential adopters because you can give them a lot of information as a foster to help them find the best home, not just any home. So I love being able, you know, it's always a little sad. Sometimes I get a little teary eyed when they leave, but it's just so lovely to see, you know, them get a great home and to know that they got a great foster home and care and that, you know, they're going to have the best possible chance of, of really having a wonderful life. And it does. It makes such a huge, huge difference having that love, having that security, sleeping in a bed in an environment that isn't crazy and stressful. And it's such a beautiful thing, like you said, to watch their real selves unfold. You know, I mean, I've seen that with my rescues and nothing makes my heart happier. It's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So tell people what's involved in being a foster and what does a shelter or rescue generally provide and what don't they provide? Well, I mean, again, it's sort of up to however the rescue wants to do it and what the potential foster is capable of doing. But for instance, We like to pay our fosters and we have people that volunteer as fosters out of the kindness of their own heart. And that's great. Of course, we love that too. But we do compensate our fosters, not a lot, but we, for instance, provide food, supplies, cat litter or dog toys, treats. Obviously, we cover the veterinarian care, you know, of a rescue animal for our fosters. So if something were to happen, they know where to go, which veterinarians we have accounts with. And obviously we're there for them in case anything should go wrong. But it really just varies. It varies. You know, a lot of people will foster, volunteer foster and don't mind coming out of pocket for food or supplies or things. But we like to provide those things because we feel that that way People are really taking it seriously, and it's something where it's a little bit more of, of a job than just saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to do this and for free. But this way, you know, they don't ever come out of pocket. It helps mm-hmm. chip in for their gas. It helps chip in for any sort of transportation, all that stuff. And so, you know, it's not a lot, but it's a little, and we like to compensate people so that they're not ever paying for anything. And so that's kind of how it works for us, but it varies for different rescues and it varies for different individuals. I mean, if you certainly wonderful to, to just be a volunteer foster and, and be able to give to an animal and then let it go on to its great forever home. But it all sort of, it can be a little different for everybody, but that's how kind of we like to do it. Okay. I kind of think of it as being like a, a loving bridge, right? Between where the animal came from and its forever wonderful home. So, and that bridge is, super important. It's something to really, really take seriously because you're basically setting that animal up for success. So you want to make sure that you are teaching them like good manners and you are giving them the kind of love and support that they need to really come out of themselves and slowly sort of let go of whatever trauma they might have experienced in the past. So it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Not everybody has the ability to foster long term. I mean, there are some fosters who keep animals for a year or more that eventually do get adopted, but sometimes people can only do short-term fostering. So if they can't do a long-term commitment, maybe if they only have a month or a couple of months, how does that work? Is that okay for the animal? Like, what would you advise? Yeah. I mean, sometimes, for instance, I rescued a dog from a high kill shelter that had been there for six weeks and was probably not going to make it too much longer. And I fostered her for three days and I always keep them at least for, and to make sure that they're not Mm. sick, they don't have kennel cough, everyone's got their vaccinations and they're healthy. Mm. Um, This dog happened to be spayed already. So she was fine. She wasn't sick. She was in great shape. And I found some friends of a friend and they adopted her in less than a week. So we only had her for six days. And that was perfect. I mean, that doesn't always happen, but you know, sometimes fostering can just be a, a couple weeks and mm-hmm. it's really just sort of a case by case. And I think any fostering is better than none. So if you can only commit to a couple of weeks, that's still fine. I think it's also a great way if you're thinking of adopting a dog or a cat, but you 
aren't really sure, if you try fostering, you can get a sense of what the responsibilities are. You can also get, you can try out different animals and see what the love connection is, if this is an animal you'd want to keep forever and or just continue fostering. So it's a good way for people to also figure out whether or not they want to make a long-term commitment or whether they even want to adopt an animal full-time. So Yeah, that, that's a great I think, point. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we try to get forever homes for our animals as soon as possible. We, we obviously want them to bond with their new owners, to feel comfortable and not be moved around a lot. But, you know, it just depends. And we've had some fosters that have kept dogs for six months. And then we've had some fosters like myself with six days. So (laughs) it just varies, you know. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Now, if you can't foster, how else can one help through fosterforkids.com? Well, there's also a way transportation is a huge factor for rescue as well. You know, a lot of these shelters, especially like in big cities, they're all over the place. Like in Los Angeles, for instance, you know, some of our shelters are two, three hours away, especially with our horrible traffic here. So the great thing is, is you can sign up to transport an animal. So let's say a rescue is going to pull some dogs or cats. And, you know, you can't foster or make a long-term commitment or adopt, but maybe you've got a car and you like to drive and maybe you'd like to get your gas paid for and help an animal out. You can sign up to be a transporter as well. There's a lot of people who are retired who don't work, but like to maybe take the car out for a spin and get out on the open road. They could go to a shelter and pick up a shelter animal and either deliver it to a rescue or to a foster home or to a boarding facility. And that's a huge help too. And that just takes a couple hours as opposed to days or months or whatever. But that's a huge help. We're always looking for people to do transport. Great, great. It's So with Foster for Kids being about a year old at this point, how widespread is it in terms of fosters and shelters slash rescues uh, around the country? Well, we definitely need some help in the more rural areas, I think. I mean, obviously the cities, there's a lot more information and networks and people together, but we're in it for the long haul. I mean, this is something that we're building upon so that we're running the marathon here, not the sprint. So we're Mm -hmm. slowly building and trying to get it out there, asking people to pass on the information, spread the word about fostering and about transportation for shelter animals. So it's been pretty good. It's sort of a slow build, but we feel like we're, we're getting the word out and more and more people are hearing about it through people like yourself and radio and TV and print. So it's coming along and we're happy with it. Great. We'll definitely do our part over here. And I also want to get the two uh, shelters that I work with here involved and some people that I know that foster here to sign up because we want to make sure that this part of South Florida is well represented so that when we need a foster or we need a rescue or shelter, we know where to look. So We will do our part over here, Allison. (laughs) Great. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, no, we we need it. I mean, it's really about trying to to build this and connect people and having it be a great experience for everybody, um, especially the animals. So exactly. That was our goal. All right. Cool. Cool. So we're going to take a short break, but don't go away because when we come back, we're going to talk with Allison about what it was like growing up in Eastwood. We're going to talk about the unusual animals that she and her father have shared and her TV show that uncovered something very, very important. So refresh that beverage, get comfortable, and we'll be right back. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back. Right after we kibble a little with our sponsors. Molly, here's your dinner. (laughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's go. 
Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to Bark and Swagger on Pet Life Radio. I'm Jody Miller Young, and we're here today with Allison Eastwood, who recently founded FosterForKids.com, a resource to connect shelters and rescues with foster parents. A fabulous idea. So, Allison, you grew up surrounded by nature and animals. Tell us what your childhood was like growing up in Eastwood, growing up with all these animals, and some of them unconventional animals that were a part of your family. Yeah. Well, I had a pretty magical upbringing, I got to say. I feel very blessed and Mm -hmm. grateful that I was able to grow up in a beautiful place in the central coast of California and on the ocean. And we had uh, orphan deer that we raised when we were little and we had all sorts of critters. My actually, my dad and my brother are allergic to dogs and cats. So we never, Uh we didn't have a lot of, yeah, we (laughs) didn't have a lot of, we did have a dog, but once the dog passed away, you know, my mom decided with my brother's allergies that we should stick to things without, you know, a lot of allergens. So we Mm. had pet rats, birds, I had anything, goldfish. I think I even had hermit crabs at one point, <laughs> which, you know, are cute, but not particularly <laughs> loving. I always had, I had bunnies, you know, I was always saving things and rescuing things. And like I mentioned, we had these two orphan deer that, that lived with, that came to live with us when their mom was sort of tragically killed and we got to raise them. And that was really fun and it was pretty great. I mean, we, just ran around and we were lived in a forest and there was lots of critters and, you know, it just couldn't have been more of a kind of beautiful place to grow up. So it sounds totally enchanted and it sort of like laid the groundwork for what ended up to be your life's work. So, I mean, it was obvious back then that you were all about the animals talking about some of the unconventional pets you were raised with you and your dad share a big love of rats. How did you guys become fans? I know. What's special (laughs) about them? And tell us about yours and your dad's long-tailed pets. Yeah, well, you know, we got rats, I think, when we were kids. And these aren't like wild rats. I, I don't suggest befriending wild rats, obviously, because they can carry diseases and things. But these were rats that you got in the pet store at the time. And I've actually now rescued some rats from being either snake food or that were, Mm. who knows what what was going to happen. A bunch Mm. of lab rats were actually released from laboratories and we're looking for rescue homes. So there's lots of different rats out there, but we just have always loved rats. I don't know. I'm not a big horoscope person or a believer in that, but I'm year of the rat in Chinese horoscope. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'm always like, I don't really know how we, yeah, I could. I don't know how we ended up loving rats, but you know, they're really great creatures. I mean, they're incredibly intelligent. They're very sweet. They can be very affectionate. You know, they're great, especially they're very smart and they're really great for kids. My brother and I really learned how to be responsible. We had a big cage. We had to clean the cage out once or twice a week and we had to feed them all their fresh food and their things. So, you know, it's a great way to teach responsibility if you can't have a dog or a cat. And they're obviously contained. We took them out a lot and played with them and it was a lot of fun. But we just, they're really lovely creatures. I mean, I've had some rats that were really special and they're highly intelligent and very social. So my dad loves them too. He's got, I think he has three rats now and oh, two of them what are came from, um, let's see. I don't remember what his rats names are. We have two, we have a mom and a baby mm-hmm. and they're big mama and monkey. Uh-huh. And then his rats, I think are, he's got a Dumbo rat and there's a lot of different kinds of rats, you know, so they're really interesting. I have uh, no idea. Different kinds. Yeah. If you actually look on the internet, if you Google like fancy rats, Mm -hmm. there's like societies of people all over the world that love rats and they post all these pictures and some lady had this rat where she had it doing like an agility course. Oh no, I was was, just going to say that. I saw that. It is amazing. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that, that love rats. 
So mostly when you say you have rats, people look at you weird and think that you're maybe a little off kilter, but they're actually really, really cool. And they're great little pets and great little animals. And uh, yeah, so I don't know the names of his, I forgot, but we have Big Mama and Monkey and we've had lots of other uh, rats in the past. I mean, unfortunately, they don't live a long time, but they sort of burn bright and uh, and mm. go on. But they're really, you know, they're special. And uh, I don't know why, but we've always shared a love for rats. They are adorable. There are a couple of photographers, you may know about them, on Pinterest who they strictly photograph rats and they photograph them with like little stuffed animals and in all of these settings that are super adorable. They're very, very cute. Very yeah, cute. no, they are. They're so, very, very cute. So yeah. They're, they're like, they're, they're little earthlings just like we are. And they, yep. you know, they, they want love and affection and so, you know, be, have a social environment. And so they're a lot of fun. Exactly. We just have to, the only thing is we have to keep our cats away. <laughs> oh, We've please. got, you know, <laughs> the rats are in the, they have their own room. We have a little room where we have the rodents, the bunnies and the rats live together. And then obviously the cats are separate, but it's funny because our cats can hear, we leave all of our cage doors open so that they roam free in this room. So the cats go and sit by the door and like can hear them running around in there and they just are fascinated and, you know, they want to get in there so bad, but they're, you know, they're we rubbing don't, their we don't allow that. Together. <laughs> Yeah, they're literally sitting by the by the door, and you know, like like they they can hear what's going on, and they're really you can tell they want to get in there. Yeah. Sort of, it's almost like they're cat TV. They just sit there and they're fascinated with what's behind that door, but they can right. never go. <laughs> yeah. Let's make a deal, door number one, please. <laughs> yes, yeah, but we do have a dog that loves our rats, so we bring our dog. We have one dog, and she comes and lays down, and. The rats come out and uh, they clean her face. <laughs> so oh, that's it's really thing cute. Ever. Oh my god! Yeah, oh my god. it's it's Very pretty adorable. it's pretty funny. It's unusual, but we just have this one dog that literally loves every kind of animal. She's just the most docile, sweet dog, and she loves the rabbits and the rats, and she totally comes and hangs out with them. So oh, pretty cute. Well, now in 2012, National Geographic aired. What was a pretty ambitious show of yours and your high school friend? Is her name Mesa? Maisa. She's Maisa. my rescue partner. Yeah, and your Maisa rescue and partner. I. Yes. Yeah. She's the one that Ma came up with the foster fur kids. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the show is called Animal Intervention, and it was about exotic animals people keep as pets, right? And the effects that that, that has on the animals and people. Yeah, I mean, it was an animal rescue show. Tell yeah. us about what it was like traveling the country and seeing these firsthand, you know, these harrowing. Well, it was, it was tough. I, you know, we only did one season of it, and I think that we had pretty good ratings, but I think National Geographic Wild felt that it was just kind of tough for people to watch it, you know, and we, as you know, we live in a world where we just see bad news and horrible things happening all the time. So I don't know if the show, it was tough to watch, but it was far more tough to actually make it. I mean, it was really the hardest thing I've ever done. It got me into doing rescue and being a much more prominent animal advocate, but you know, I'm kind of glad that it didn't continue because it was, it just broke my heart and it was really hard on me. We traveled all around the country. There's only, I think, eight states that allow private citizens to have exotic animals as pets or mm -hmm. roadside zoos, etc. And we were seeing all these animals in peril and trying to help them. And some people wanted help, some people didn't. Some people felt that, you know, the animal wasn't being mistreated when it was clear that this was just not a good environment for it. So it was painful. It was really hard to see. I mean, we had a lot of good things come out of it, but it was really a tough show to do. So it did awaken something in me and, and, and I'm glad that I did it. And, you know, I mean, there I, still are a lot of animals out there in people's backyards, tigers mm -hmm. and bears. And Yeah, it's horrible. Kind of crazy. It's horrible. I remember you telling me when we last spoke that you, and I'm sure this wasn't the only person, but this particular person was 
putting themselves in danger too because of their desire to keep this exotic animal as a pet and this animal obviously wasn't happy and well adjusted. I'm sure that you learned about some pretty crazy experiences that wacky people had with these animals but refused to give them up. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who felt that because they had purchased this tiger cub or bear as a baby and raised it or the monkey or something, I mean, that they, you know, that these were like their family, which it's great to feel that way. And I love to have bond with animals, but exotic animals just do not make good pets. They're not domesticated and it takes something like eight to 10 generations to even start the domestication process. Really? And it's just, yeah, I mean, that was something I learned that you can't just get a tiger cub, even if it's a few days old, and raise it as a regular cat. It's still going to have instincts that are wild. It's still going to, it's not going to listen to you like a domesticated dog or a cat. There's just no way to ever predict. And it's just, it's dangerous. It may not happen when it's young, but at some point, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we've all seen different things on the news about chimpanzees attacking people and ripping their faces off and, you know, Travis. getting attacked. Yeah. I mean, Travis and that woman's friend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a horrible situation. Uh And I mean, it doesn't matter if you get them when they're young or not. They're unpredictable and they still are a wild animal with wild instincts. And, you know, it's just extremely dangerous to have them thinking that they're just one of the family members because that's just not the case. But, you know, I mean, there were a lot of people out there that that just don't believe that. And it's sort of, I think it's sort of a little bit of an ego trip sometimes with people thinking, no, no, you know, I'm dominant over this animal. It's like, yeah, I can tame this type. Yeah. Yeah. We went and we went and interviewed this one magician in Missouri who no longer is allowed to have cats in his show. But we were sitting there filming him and this cat took a swipe at him and almost connected with his face. And that was on camera. And we all looked at each other like, wow, here we are filming this guy sitting here with this leopard. And he thinks, oh, this is one of my big babies. And this thing took a swipe at him with full claws out and it almost got him in the face. And we were terrified that if we had filmed that, it would have been horrible. And uh, it was really scary. And I saw a lot of scary stuff like that where people just didn't make the connection that wild Mm -hmm. animals really shouldn't be pets. Absolutely. Now, you have your rescue partner in your friend from high school, but you yeah. have another partner, another like-minded partner in your husband, Stacy Poitras. Yeah. Yeah. For those who don't know <laughs> Stacy or know about Stacy, he is a really talented chainsaw sculptor, and he had a show, Chainsaw Gang, that was a big hit on CMT. What is your idea of a perfect night together? And I ask oh, that well, because I have a feeling I know what it's going to be. Yeah, I, I, it's no surprise. <laughs> Last night, we actually stayed up till about almost one in the morning playing with all the kittens in the garage. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty much a perfect night. We don't go out much. We don't, we socialize a little bit and, you know, but we're, we sort of are homebodies and we love taking care of the animals and we decided not to have human kids in this life and dedicate our, our time and our love to our animal children. So yeah, basically we love to stay home and uh, hang out with the critters and give lots of love and attention to everybody and maybe watch a ball game or something, but you know, we're, we're pretty, we're kind of boring at this point. <laughs> you know what? You're preaching to the converted over here. That's our favorite thing to do too with our four doggies. So totally get it. Now talking about giving all the critters love and hanging out with all of them at last count, when we talked, it was 10. How many animals do you have now? Uh, okay. We have four cats, okay. three dogs, two bunnies, two rats, and two horses. I don't know how many. <laughs> I can't count out loud. <laughs> count. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, math is obviously not. But that is not my guess. Um, yeah, it's not my yeah. guess. Either. But that's a so, beautiful, large family, and and we love it. Yeah. Over, so and eight foster babies, and so we've yeah we've got a full house right now. We've got a lot. Uh, we're not yeah. got a lot of 
great dogs, but they're all um, at other fosters. So we're we're predominantly mm-hmm. doing cats right now because for some reason we just you know usually there's sort of a kitten season, but we've just it's been nonstop here in Los Angeles with kittens and lots of lots of litter still coming in late in the wow. season. So we're trying to trying to do our part to get these babies to safety because you know kittens are one of the most euthanized animals in, in kill shelters because they come in and they're so little, a lot of them are underage. And here in California, they're deemed, you know, not adoptable if they're under eight weeks. So if a rescue doesn't take them, they're more than likely going to be put to sleep right away. So we try to intervene on mm, behalf of yeah. the babies. Do you do trap neuter release as part of the Eastwood Ranch Foundation or you work with people who we- do? Yeah, we work with people who do. We have a great alliance with a nonprofit called Fix Nation here in Los Angeles, and they do that. And then, you know, obviously a lot of rescues we help uh, and support that do feral or semi-feral communities. And Mm -hmm. I think somebody said the other day that we have something like over 3 million homeless cats just in the city of Los Angeles. So it's really important. Yeah, so it's really important to get them fixed and try to get them some care because they're just, I don't think there's enough homes for all these cats. And some of them are friendly. And as long as we can get them fixed and make sure that they're not sickly or passing on diseases to each other, a lot of them are happy just to, to live outside and we do the best we can. But yeah, we definitely try to support that as well. Absolutely. Do you still make those beautiful fruit and vegetable meals, breakfast and stuff for your animals? Yes, they eat better than we do. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) They eat better than we do. (laughs) Yeah, the the rats every morning and my friends always get a kick out of it because if they come and spend the night or anyone sees what I'm doing, every morning I get up and I make like uh, this most gorgeous fruit, vegetable, all organic quinoa, <laughs> I love all these it. different things. And I make that for the rats. And then the bunnies get like a full chopped salad and fruit. And yeah, I mean, everyone, they eat way healthier than we do, you know. Oh, so. it's fantastic. It's, you know, they're the kids, you know, we always do for the kids. The kids come first. Yes. Yeah. The kids Absolutely. come first. Absolutely. You mentioned last time we spoke that one of your dreams was to build a brick and mortar sanctuary. Is that still in the works? Like yeah. A, a big one. Well, yeah. It is. We just finished our business proposal and we're just starting to raise money. We found some land here in Los Angeles. It's it's not going to be a huge ranch, but it's sort of going to be a smaller domestic rescue facility and adoption center. So that's mm-hmm. sort of what we're going to start with is doing predominantly domestic and maybe a little bit of farm animal, smaller ones though, because we will have some room for maybe some rescue pigs or goats or some smaller animals. But eventually the goal is is to have a real sanctuary, hopefully a couple hundred acres where animals that need a home that have either been, you know, are unwanted, neglected or abused or retired from God knows what, circuses, mm-hmm. whatever. We'd love to have a, a sanctuary where, you know, these animals can just live out the rest of their life in peace and not be bothered and, and not be sort of uncared for. They can just have a nice place to, to live. And that's the goal. But, you know, that's sort of down the road. That's a beautiful thing. Um, Is there anything else that you'd like to leave listeners with that we haven't covered about foster fur kids or anything else you're working on? No, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. We've got the website going. We covered a lot. We've got the website. There's always something. I'd say the last thing I'd like to say is there's always something you can do to help animals every day. If you can't give money, there's always sharing things on social media, signing petitions, creating petitions. If you can give, skip your Starbucks or whatever your splurge is and give five or ten dollars to your local rescue or shelter, newspapers, old blankets and sheets, things like that need to be donated to rescues and shelters. And if you have old supplies, you know, maybe you had a dog and you had a carrying case or a crate and you're not using it anymore. There's so many things you can do to help your community and your rescue community. There's rescues all over this country and all over the world Mm -hmm. that can always use support on any level. 
volunteer. You know, if you want, you don't have money to give, but you've got a little extra time, go down and volunteer, go do whatever you can to to find out how you can help because there's lots of ways besides monetary compensation to help rescues and to help animals in need. And it's so good for the heart, really. It's it's all about starting local. Sometimes the grand gesture is a lot of local gestures that uh, create power in terms of the big picture. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, animals, you know, we live longer when you have pets. There's lots yeah. of studies out there that show that. And it's really your, what you just said is very important. It's good for the heart, especially during the holiday season. You know, sometimes people get lonely or depressed. You know, it can be a difficult time for people who maybe don't have family or whatever it is. But if you go out there and you help an animal, it warms your heart, it makes you feel good, and you feel like you've done something that made a difference in an, in an animal's life. And that generosity really goes a long way, and it permeates through everybody out there in your community and, and in our country. And I think it's important to spread that sort of generosity, especially at the end of the year. Mm, Well said. Well said. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with us today, Allison. My pleasure. Thanks again. Once again, everybody, fosterforkids.com is a great solution to a big problem that helps shelters free up space so they can help other animals in need. Fostering really does save lives. So if you're interested in finding out more or registering your rescue or shelter or to be a foster or transporter, go to fosterforkids.com. All the info you need is there. Allison, wishing you much continued success with Foster for Kids and continued success with the Eastwood Ranch Foundation. The animals, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Wonderful. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mark Winter, our producer, who makes this sound so good. My passion is living stylishly in animal rescue. So tune in next time to discover the designers, home decor, styles, and rescue stories I love. And don't forget to visit me at BarkAndSwagger.com where you'll find great fashion, shelter stories, and more. So until next time, when fierce fashion calls, bark and swagger. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.